Welcome to another episode of the River of Suck podcast. This is my sweet 16 episode. It's my 16th time doing this, and I'm really excited. My name is Andy Reiner. I am the host of River of Suck podcast, which you are listening to now. Thank you for listening, dear listener. Our special guest today is Enyan Peltatiller. She is an amazing, multifaceted artist, dabbling strongly and billowing clouds of magic fiddle music as well as she's an amazing singer songwriter and an arranger she plays in a band called tarka what am i forgetting oh educator you teach people how to do things helping people see the path so anyway hey Anion, how's it going hey ellie it's going great i'm happy to be here thank Yay. you for having me absolutely i love the way you play the fiddle so I'm really excited to pick your brain and find out how you think about thinking. Ah, well, I don't know that I think about it, but I'll think about it for you. <laughs> that's, uh, wow, I really appreciate it. That's a that's a honor and a privilege. Privilege, privilege. <laughs> An honor and a privilege. <laughs> Words are hard sometimes. <laughs> When you wake up every day, what do you do to make you feel like you? This might feel sort of obvious, but I do not feel like me if I don't, as close to the start of the day as possible, actually go engage in music making. Ooh. It's been something that for, for a long time I've realized, like, you know, if when I was in high school, if I was going to go out with my friends or something like that, if I didn't engage in music making by myself, you know, sort of interface with my own mind in that way, then whatever thing I was doing with my friends in high school, when we went out, I would just be thinking about that. And I would feel actually very bad and guilty. Like I had betrayed myself. <laughs> if I didn't, go, <laughs> if I went and did, you know, fun things without having engaged in the also fun thing of kind of reconnecting with my musical self. Is that called proactive artistry? I guess I guess you could <laughs> call it that. Yeah, and and there are days and times when that doesn't happen and I really notice a difference in my psychological framework like for the whole day. What's off? I've heard you talk about thought piranhas. Oh, yes. On this podcast and they come for me in various forms, many numerous things I do. Um, they come for me and try and get me. <laughs> and uh, wow. they, they show up more frequently if I haven't like if I haven't engaged in this thing that has been a part of my life, you know, practically since birth. Wow. That sounds like a good plan. I think I should do that more. And I think that would help me out a lot. Despite talking a lot about thought piranhas, I've, I mean, I experienced them, of course. That's why, <laughs> that's why <laughs> that's I'm why talking, talking about, about them. them. Yeah. I don't necessarily have to pick it up because I have something that I'm working towards, although very often I do. But um, mm -hmm. the, the most important thing I've realized for myself, you know, the, the goals are great. I have all kinds of things I'm working on. Um, but to just spend, you know, minimally like a half an hour just improvising, Ooh. conversing with myself. Wow. Ha and that's been a part of my practice for a whole lot of my life. 
So that's probably why it's so important. It's Decades. just sort of the, yeah. Wow. Just sort of the, the musical language I've developed with myself is pretty important to check in with. I don't know if you could compare it to journaling, which is not something that I've ever been able to do successfully. <laughs> but I think maybe it's like that. Maybe I should start actually recording those improvisations <laughs> instead of just doing them. Yeah. So do you wake up early to do that? or? Oh, uh, I'd have like... to wake up so early. One thing that you didn't mention in your introduction is that I'm a mom. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> which necessitates waking up early anyway. And I, I can't get up any earlier than I already do. So the very first thing I do is I take care of someone else's needs, <laughs> um, which, you know, I'm quite happy to do. I love my son. And, you know, it's a pretty easy sort of route progression getting ready in the morning. And then when he's off to school, then... Um, Ah, then you have your chance to Then I have my chance. So usually, yeah, usually I get my cup of tea or coffee or whatever and then try and head down. And, you know, sometimes I don't have as much time as I would like because I've got to go off and teach or something like that. But, you know, hopefully at least an hour or two I can spend. What defines your style of music? Ah, that's been a really hard question because I love so many different kinds of music. I mean, (laughs) if I hear something that I like, whether it's an instrumental form, no matter what culture it's from, whether it's a song that isn't even in English, I'm probably going to try and learn it. Yeah. And it's been always very hard for me to pin down what style of music I actually play. And other people have certainly tried to do that for me. Like for a, what, what a long they while, say? <laughs> a long while I was like a violinist who played Eastern European music. That's, you know, that's just happened to be what people heard me playing at that time. And right. you know, then I've been pegged as a bluegrass fiddler. People have called me all kinds of things I don't know that I identify with any one yeah. style or genre. I just sort of love everything very much that's good music. I love all good music, and I try and get as inside everything that I love to listen to yeah. as much as I can. I call that being a sponge. You can't help it. You just yeah. absorb awesome things, and then it becomes part of you. Exactly. One of the defining elements, I think, of your band Tarka is that you're actually a music band. I wouldn't call because <laughs> I I don't want to be in a bluegrass band or a, this band. I want to be in a music band. We're a band of people who play music together, and I think that defines it enough for me in a lot of ways. Now, the marketing people don't like that. No, they sure don't. <laughs> and something I've also found, like especially. As a younger musician, it's, I'm, I'm getting over it now that I'm getting all old. But um, <laughs> when people tell you that you are doing something or that, you know, that you should be doing something in particular, like a style, you, you sort of believe that. And also, if it's not very natural to you to just do one thing, then you kind of, you start questioning yourself quite a bit. And and you all sorts of thing, fun things like imposter syndrome Ooh. show up, and you know. So that term you use, being the USU, it's important to discover who that is, and not let anybody tell you what that's supposed to be for you. Well, but, especially you can't even tell me what it is. So yeah, anybody who tells you what it is is going to be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You're leaving it neb- just nebulous enough. You're like. I play a five-string fiddle. Yeah, I play a five-string fiddle, and maybe my accent sounds one way to one person and one way to another person, but I play Indian music. (laughs) Yes, exactly. You play... What kind of music do I play? I play my music. Yeah. (laughs) 
so that's kind of you now, right? You're this hard to pin down, but versatile, improvisatory fiddle human. You're like a chameleon, right? How is fiddle such a big part of your life? My parents were both amateur musicians. Um, my dad in particular, and my dad was a stay-at-home dad. He stayed at home with me when I was like one and a half, two years old. Oh, wow. Because my mom had to go work as a developmental psychologist in fabulous far-off places like Texas. And <laughs> <laughs> so and my dad loves music, and he's really a beautiful, brilliant musician in a lot of ways. And before I ever started playing violin, he would play these improvisation games with me, like little call-and-response games. Oh, cool. Like on, with instruments or with words? With voice. Mm. I don't really remember it because I was like probably not quite two. Oh, okay. But this is what I'm told. And, oh, okay. <laughs> but I think those are improvisation games that like of the sort that I still play with my students mm -hmm. um, and that a lot of teachers that teach improvisation do, I'm sure. So I had always that feeling of freedom around music. So when I started playing violin a year or so later, that way of thinking about music was already in my mind, I think. Hmm. Um, so for that reason, the rigidity of classical music, which is more or less how I started playing, never felt totally natural. Hmm. But I still, you know, I did it. And I played fiddle tunes, like mostly Irish tunes with my dad. He plays guitar, mandolin. Um, at the time, he played a little bit of cello. And my mom played flute and saxophone they used to take me out and busk with them and stuff some in san francisco oh wow um, so you're playing on the street as a little kid yeah probably more for the cuteness than anything else <laughs> well you know there's a time when that works and then there's a time when you have to play real music that's exactly actually i think street performing is one of the places where you learn as a musician what is exactly what is your usu because the thing that you bring totally. to a street performing has to be like i mean people are passing by you have to grab them instantly like what can you do that'll get exactly their attention? yeah and definitely some of my formative years like especially after college figuring out what i wanted to do were subway performances oh cool like i spent a good year and a half or more busking in the New York subways. So nice. That, Wait, where did you go to college? I did a dual degree program at the Peabody Institute and Johns Hopkins University and came out of that, like, I call it being in a fight with music because... Uh -oh. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> well, I, sp I spent all this time in this very traditional classical institution and also, like, trying to get an English degree at the same time. Mm. It was a pretty intense program. And not really well thought out at that time. So <laughs> kind of trying to figure out where to place my focus hmm. without very much assistance and having to travel back and forth between two campuses. It was challenging. And also I was like, I love class classical music deeply, but I think I was already figuring out at that time that that's not like exactly who I wanted to be. Sure. So I came out of school like totally confused having spent all this time like studying orchestral rep repertoire and concerti and sonatas and what do I do with this because I don't <laughs> want to go work in an orchestra that would be <laughs> very wrong for me so after working in the tech industry for a little bit and like finding that maybe the break from really playing a lot was beneficial i got back into playing by starting to busk in the subways ah, so starting what kind of stuff were you playing in the subway um my favorite thing to play was i don't know if you know the um japanese melody sakura could you show us yeah
doesn't normally end like that, but um, yeah, it's just a very simple melody. And for whatever reason, um, I really enjoy just spending like <laughs> really long periods of time improvising on that, and then you know playing the fiddle tunes that I remembered. Mm-hmm. Um, and through doing that, I started meeting musicians that were maybe more aligned with where I was going, where I wanted to end up. Um, and also figured out like what, what was meaningful for me in performance, because when I was a kid growing up playing classical music, the solo performing aspect of it was very terrifying (laughs) and hugely anxiety causing. I'm not, I can't even really remember where that came from, but it was really, really bad. And somehow playing my own improvised music or fiddle tunes or whatever in front of anonymous people on the subway was um, a big step towards getting rid of those very frightened, anxious feelings that I had developed around performance. Whoa. So you stepped outside of your comfort zone, though, in order to kind of create a new one in a way i guess yeah you could say that but there had to be yeah it sounds like a a leap a little bit and then somehow you ended up here in colorado i was busking in the subways i met this banjo player who said can you play bluegrass and i had not played much bluegrass properly and i said sure and we played a tune together (laughs) yeah um you know, I've always had a pretty quick ear, so I picked up what he was playing, and I could improvise something that sounded appropriate to me, whether or not <laughs> it was stylistically appropriate at the time. Subway um, music. Subway music. And so I got hired for his band, and um, hey. lo and behold, my future husband had been hired for his band um, just a week or two before. Cool. And we met and started sharing our mutual love of all sorts of weird music and writing music together and we moved to portland oregon and then on our way there we stopped in colorado and i thought huh this place is pretty cool (laughs) i'd like to come back here sometime and then like five years later we moved here would you say that being here in colorado makes you feel more like yourself i think in in many ways i mean it's there There's a lot of wide open space here, wide open space to be in nature. Mm -hmm. And having that space, I don't know, it creates mental space. Like if you're living in a city, like everybody else's mental space is all up in your your own mental space. It's all very close together. Yeah. Yeah. And so something about the, the expanses here help me i think be in touch with who i am what i'm about i feel that that's why i was in rocky mountain national park this morning (laughs) (laughs) that's an awesome story and now you just play music here and have an awesome life having fun being a music colorado human yeah that sounds great (laughs) It's, it's it's pretty great and i'd say like at this point most of the music i've written in my life was written in Colorado now that I've been here long enough. Cool. So I give Colorado lots of credit for that. You were talking about this like kind of vocal improv game. Mm -hmm. I wondered if we could play one. That sounds good. Let's do it. Well, how does this work? What happens? Well, nowadays I play it. I haven't played it with voice um, in a very long time. Nowadays, it's something that I do with my students mm-hmm. on fiddle. It's sort of a a part of most of my students' lessons, usually near the end, because it's fun. It's a treat. Oh, yeah. Um, but I might sing... A simple phrase and you might sing something back to me that feels like an appropriate response okay as simple as that cool 
So when you're playing it with voice, you have to think about all sorts of things like what syllables are you going to sing that sound, that won't sound too dorky? <laughs> Centipede sandwich. There's a peacock on the wall. And I'm floating inside it. It has 10,000 toes. I wish I had 10,000 toes. If I had so many toes, I would have to have plugs in my nose. I would need so many shoes. It would be expensive. And would give me the blues. (laughs) Nice. Okay. That's the idea. (laughs) Yeah, totally. So now we're going to do one that's going to be a call and response between Enyan and you, the listener. So we're going to leave space for you to respond vocally back into your headphones or your car, wherever you're at. It's sweet singing time. You got to think of something. If there's a moose on your wall, Just make sure it doesn't fall on your head. There's elephants in the valley. There are lions in the river. Everything we say And that is what we learned today. <laughs> yeah. All right. I hope I hope everybody out there that you got your part right because I was imagining exactly what you might sing <laughs> in response. <laughs> it's that's like something I've been trying to do lately as like a way of upping my improvisation game. Um is to improvise lyrics, which I know a number of people who are quite good at that. Um, as, of course, the, the fellow whose hat you're wearing. Oh, Mr. yes. Mr. Rashad Eggleston is a brilliant um, linguistic, pan-linguistic, polyglot, <laughs> weird improviser man. Um, yeah. And I know a few other folks who are really good at that, and it... It takes a certain greater measure of letting go, I think, than just improvising notes to be able to put words out there in the world. Well, you have to suck at something before you can be good at exactly. it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I'm, I'm always trying to suck at new things. It's one of my, my ambitions in life, <laughs> to suck at as many things as possible. <laughs> Wow, that's super cool. So let's talk about the River of Suck. Fantastical magic river of opportunity and terror all in one. We're on one side. Behind us is our comfort cave. On the other side, we can see future versions of ourselves who can do the things we wish we could do now. And in between is the raging, roaring River of Suck. Filled with whitewater rapids and rocks and thought piranhas, our friends, or our frenemies, our enemy friends, frenemies, thought piranhas and all kinds of things, trying to sabotage our good vibe. How do you get good at something if you've never done it before? And how do we see a vision of where we want to be and how do we get there? So this analogy of the river gives us a nice little visual to plan our progress. Maybe we swim across... Maybe we make a plan. Maybe we end up downstream with a new vista. And we reach the other side and we realize, oh, wait, I know nothing. (laughs) 
<laughs> which is daunting but really fun. So, yeah, you have to suck at something before you can be good at it. You just said you love to suck at as many things as possible. That's a life goal. It is in a way. I, th- I think part of that comes from being an educator. I've been playing violin pretty much my whole life and from my perspective like there you know there's always so much more for me to learn about this instrument and many more things I can do on it but it still isn't the same as an eight-year-old child who's coming to me to learn violin for the first time or even you know a 15-year-old child who has been playing for a long time and is pretty good that the uh the way they're approaching that river mm-hmm. still is with, say, substantially more trepidation <laughs> than I might, having crashed through it several times. So, But what are we afraid of? Sounding bad? And then people won't like us? I've, I've sort of forgotten, but the fear, you know, it still comes, doesn't it? Well, fear comes in different ways in different situations. And I think one of the interesting things about fear is that we can't control it and we don't know when it's going to happen to us. <laughs> That's true. That's true. And there's all sorts of things that happen to us throughout our lives that sort of set us up to feel afraid of situations. Like maybe it is that we are afraid we're going to sound bad and say someone we love and admire very much, maybe a parent or a sibling might yeah. not like what they're hearing, for instance. I think Judgment. I have a lot of kids that worry about that. But one of the reasons I like to try new things, try to acquire new skills, like earlier we were talking about um, flat fitting. Oh, yeah. And that's that's one thing I've been sucking at recently. But working on that, like, you know, I'm... It looks pretty good to me. Yeah, but I'm, you know, I'm very much a beginner, So it helps me understand better someone that's coming at playing the violin from the perspective of being a beginner. Because even though I know how to give people what works to learn to play the violin, I want to be able to give them like some psychological support too, which is, you know, not, not always there i certainly had teachers that didn't give me that so i feel like music teaching is 51 percent the music that we're working on and 49 percent mental strategy to cross that river that's sounds pretty accurate it's different for everybody and for some people it might even be you know 60 percent mental strategy Hmm. because of where they're at so staying really well in touch with that is important Well, as an educator, it's really cool. I think we can see so much potential sometimes in people who don't even believe in themselves. Yeah. It's amazing how much people can improve and not know that they're improving. Uh Uh-huh. And they think they've regressed or something. Yeah. I'm going backwards, you know? It's really hard to have perspective on yourself. That's why. It totally is. If you want perspective, record yourself. Otherwise, forget about it. Forget about it. This instrument is super almost impossible to sound really good at. It takes an unrealistic amount of time to accomplish your goals. I mean, do you agree this instrument is designed by a sadomasochist (laughs) for masochists who just want to suffer to get the sound in their head out? It's certainly not intuitive. There are plenty of bowed string instruments out there in the world (laughs) that are more intuitive they're still really hard. Even the nickel harpa. Yeah. If yeah. you can Just put it. keys on a thing. <laughs> <laughs> but it's hard and it's, I think we can't discount the educational culture and that surrounded this instrument for its several hundred years of existence that also makes it hard because we have all sorts of ideas about what it's supposed to be. Just the basic mechanics of it are very challenging. Yeah. And it takes some serious refinement to not make bad sounds. Right. And so many people I've met have had traumatizing experiences with teachers. And you said coming out of the conservatory school, you were you had all these fears. Yeah. I mean, what's with that? 
I don't know. <laughs> I've, I've, it's something that's been on my mind a lot lately. I'm just trying to figure out where all that came from because I can't pinpoint one moment. And I think it was like just the years of being in that environment. And you know, it's as with any culture, you don't, if you're immersed in it, you don't necessarily see the ways that it's shaping you. Mm -hmm. And then when you step out of it, then you start to be able to examine those and kind of deal with them. That sounds like a decades long trajectory. What do you <laughs> say to someone who's like, feels stuck? <laughs> Becoming in touch with what you loved about it in the first place mm. is huge. So getting, totally. and I've, I've had a few students who are, you know, in this, this form of recovery. So getting in touch with what you love about it. And, um, you know, you mentioned recording yourself, and I think that's also hugely important to do, not just to figure out, like, what you don't like about your playing, what you need to improve, but also the things that you do like mm -hmm. that you do, and that can be tremendously healing in terms of getting rid of the deeply entrenched issues around confidence and so forth that some of us end up with. Um, right. after years of being in a particular musical culture. And it's no, not just classical music right. education that does that. I know that it happens in other places too. Right. But just always looking towards what you love instead of what doesn't feel good. That's what I would say. So I guess that's the suck part is that you sound bad and you have to just kind of work through it. That's when you're like in the river and the, the water is coming up to your nose and you're trying to breathe and it's like you get water in your yeah. lungs. But as Rashad pointed out in episode one, because it's an imaginary river, you could be in a diver's suit or you could, you could, be. You could have a cape. You could have fins and gills. In your river. That's true. And <laughs> have, you, have you ever seen the movie The Abyss? Oh. Which has... Yeah, a long time ago. One of my favorite little harmonic progressions that I can hear in my head, and I don't, for whatever reason, have the language to say mm. what chord movement it is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Could you play it? down beneath that river of suck is you know you, you swim down below the depths and it's dark and it's scary and you go through a crevasse in some rocks at the bottom of the river in this big world full of lights and these beautiful alien sea creatures with this incredible city opens up so that could be down there too right yeah, hiding out in the bottom. And and that that idea that it's what you must pass through before you get good at something. I like that analogy, but in another another sense, like there's so much depth that you discover when you, you know, when you get as far along with something as we have, there's kind of no end. Yeah. To <laughs> the amount of things you can get into and not in a bad way at all in a right. sense there is no other side because yeah. it's this like beautiful i mean i'm i'm excited about spending the rest of my life discovering all the things i can about this instrument and about music the sufi 
philosopher Hazrat Inayat Khan. I don't know if you've heard of him. Um, he wrote. We'll look him up. A book called "The Music of Life," which it has some beautiful thoughts in it. But he was this brilliant veena player, the Indian instrument, the veena, and he was a virtuoso on it. And he stopped playing at twenty-four because he had learned all he could from music. <laughs> and uh, okay, like hardly, <laughs> hardly a year goes by because I'm not going to say I think about it every day, but I frequently like just puzzle over that idea that someone could learn everything <laughs> they possibly could have learned from, from any uh, anything that they are really deeply engaged in our love. I don't really get that. Right. Well, what, the more I learn, the more I feel like I actually know nothing. Yeah. <laughs> it's like when there's where our scientists have been peering out into the universe with their telescopes, <laughs> like <laughs> trying to see really far away. And at first we thought, oh, we're in the, you know, a solar system and like a galaxy. And then it's like, oh, it's infinite galaxies. Oh, it's infinite universes. It never ends. It just seems so, so big and we're so tiny. And in this, in this analogy, we're like a little ant on planet earth. But to be an ant and know that there's other galaxies and black holes and things happening that are so far away and so incomprehensible. I mean, that's how big the world of music is, I think. Absolutely. Well, every every world there is contains all the parts of every other world, so. <laughs> <laughs> what? Whoa. <laughs> well, I don't know if we've gotten to the point in the study of music where we found the black holes but i'm sure they're there right i think the the whole river of suck analogy is very apt on the one hand and on the other hand it's like well i guess that's when the river transforms Hmm. that's a real thing that happens maybe it flips back and forth sometimes it's not a river of suck it's a river of indescribable beauty and discovery yeah which I guess you pointed out right near the beginning of this conversation. <laughs> Welcome to the River of Discovery podcast, episode one. <laughs> you have to discover something before you can do it. Wait, you have to... You have to do something before you can discover it? <laughs> you have to open your eyes before you can see it. Ah, You have to listen before you can hear it. (laughs) Well said. When I think of Enyan Peltatiller, I'm like, she just rolls with the punches. Like, she could do anything. She's an amazing person. You're not, like, easily phased. When things don't go as planned, it's like you were planning for it to be that way somehow. Is that a weird thing to say, or does that make sense? (laughs) Well, I think that's consistent with kind of how I've viewed myself. Um (laughs) Like, not that I plan for the unforeseen, but just I view it as like being an improviser, sort of how I lead my life in general. Hmm. Jazz part of, life. Part of being an improviser is the very tired cliche, you know, if life gives you lemons or if, you know, your fingers give you lemons, you make really delicious lemonade out of them. Yeah. Um, yeah, that sort of kind of rolling with things. I don't know. I, I don't see that there's too much to be gained by doing it any other way for me because <laughs> all that comes with that is anxiety and stress and bad feelings. Just the feeling of wanting to be in control and not being able to be in control is ah. not something that I particularly enjoy. <laughs> 
<laughs> I mean, there's engaging with it in the sense that you can let go of that need, but in those moments before you realize that it's not a really useful way of approaching the situation, engaging with it can mean <laughs> feeling frustrated and stressed and right huh but there's there's generally a moment for me anyway where i realize that that's it's not necessary to do that but even if you appear to be just totally relaxed i mean you still have anxiety about things you st- like you have a kid you must be worried about something oh well i'm i'm an anxious person <laughs> Actually, I experience lots of anxiety. Okay. But <laughs> as an outside ob- observer, you don't seem particularly anxious. So That's wh- good to know. <laughs> but but everyone always thinks everyone else has it together completely. It's true. And that they're the only ones experiencing these like soul crushing yeah. emotions. Anxiety seems like it's something horrible. But if we all have it, and we're all anxious all the time. And we're just trying to pretend that we're not. Like, what are we doing? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if it would make us necessarily feel better if we were all able to just share our anxiety. Uh, well, maybe it would. I found it tremendously healing to be able to share my anxiety mm-hmm. with parties willing to listen. Uh-huh. Not necessarily, like, wanting to offer solutions. Oh, yes. But yeah, just listening. Just this listening. is how I feel. Yeah. Getting it out. Yeah. Right. Holding it in is, I think, or bottling it up is, it has not worked for me. I tried it for a long time. Well, yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> so parties willing to listen, there maybe could be a partner or it could be a dog or a cat. Capo yeah. doesn't listen to my problem. He doesn't offer any solutions. Well, he will. But when I like hold this furry creature, that's like its own kind of solution. <laughs> yeah. Finding a place to have an out breath mm-hmm. for your emotional tensions. It doesn't doesn't necessarily mean like talking about them. I think we end up relying on having this say stuff to get it off our chests Ah. maybe more than necessary or maybe do you just turn it into a song very often a healthy outlet for my emotions (laughs) (laughs) see I'm feeling emotionally good right now so I don't feel like I need to sing about it (laughs) Right, the good emotions are easy. It's the hard ones that are hard. It's true. They need the songs. They do need the songs. As a songwriter, I've also found, like, if there aren't enough situations creating those hard emotions, sometimes I will look for them. Oh. Which <laughs> I've heard, I, I understand I'm not the only person who's ever done that in the a history. river of suckspedition. You know, it's not unlike trying to find things ever continually new things to be bad at so Mm. that I can remain in touch with that humility, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) Right. It's hard to have the the world's biggest ego if if you're not so sure of yourself. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Everyone has a big ego these days about not having a big ego. Is it so wrong? I was definitely raised with like an aversion to saying anything good about anything that I do. Oh. And it started to occur to me that maybe it's, you know, it's not actually wrong to believe in what you're doing. It's not actually wrong to believe that you're doing, (laughs) that, that you're good at something. And it's not wrong to feel comfortable saying that. Yeah. Because I mean, if you don't if you don't believe in it, if you don't feel good about some parts of it, why do it? <laughs> I like the music that I make. I believe in it, and I'm not gonna you know I'm not gonna go around like 
saying, my music is the best music, and you know, everybody should listen to my music because it's the greatest and only my music. But I am going to say I think that I make good music. I see so many ways it can be better. But sure. I enjoy what I'm doing as a person doing it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys have a new album? We started recording an album probably almost a year and a half ago. And because of moving, so we don't really have a place to finish it. It's kind of life getting in the way. We have yet to finish it. However, there will be an album sometime in the hopefully not too distant future. And then I'm kind of trying to put together a little solo thing too because i've never done an album under my own name oh cool so, so we're gonna get to find out what the the uist onion is that's well, it's just a facet i've i've <laughs> natalie padilla actually put me up to it in a way because she said to me when we did a gig together and she said i'd love to hear you make a swing record <laughs> so I'm like, okay i should make a swing record because the jazz manouche has been a big part of my musical upbringing. I was, in fact, born listening to Django and Stefan. So I feel like it would be fun for that to be the first kind of solo cool. project album that I do. Absolutely. So how do we find your music online? As of right now, everything that is my music can be found at tarka.com, T-A-A-R-K-A.com. Sort of the the umbrella organization for mm -hmm. all musical projects and teaching. Everything's there or, you know, on the, the social media. You know people out there where to go when I say social media. And I am You're in those places. Instagram, Tarka. We're yeah. talking like Tarka on Facebook. Yeah. And I do have personal Facebook and Instagram pages, so you can like those too. Come to our shows. I really like playing for people, for humans that are in the room with me. It might be fun. I could do one of my songs and you could mm -hmm. add. Yeah, that would be super some fun. Some things. Yeah, cool. Let's do that. All right. What do I need to know? My song, Have You Ever, is, well, okay, there's some weird chords in the chorus. You could take a solo. There's, it's really just one chord for the solo, and then you wouldn't have to learn anything. Let me oh, see yeah. if I can do it. Do you ever see the sun?
Have you ever sung a song? Cause the trees asked you to As an olive branch between The now and what you once knew Have you ever moved in time? To the rhythm of the river Offered to the birds Your earthbound flight to seek their favor Tell me Do we live in the same world? Oh, if we live in the same down in the face of beauty have you ever really loved with all the pain and sense of duty have you ever felt the mass of life and love not separated raise your arms up to the sky waiting for the wind to take you away Yeah, that's such a good song. <laughs> that's awesome. Thank you. My thought piranhas say my solo sucked, but... <laughs> oh, I enjoyed it. Hey, okay, cool. There you go. Yeah, man. Your voice you caught, the, you caught the vibe. So One <laughs> thing I've figured out recently is that nothing matters more than the energy you're projecting uh. when you're performing music mm. like whatever notes you're playing <laughs> mm -hmm. it doesn't matter it's the energy that you're putting out there so if you're sitting there and you're like worried about how you're sounding that's the energy you're putting out right and you don't want to give people that probably no no it only happened after i was <laughs> Like, oh no! Yeah, yeah. Like, I, I, the I do realize was that. Like, oh God, what have <laughs> I done? <laughs> it usually happens like after I take a solo. That if I've if once I listen to it after, I'm usually cool with it. But like in yeah. the moment, I'm always like, it's like I just jumped to self doubt. I can preach all that I want about not worrying about stuff and not worrying about sounding good, but at the end of the day, that's part of my brain. And my brain's job is to worry about stuff. So I accept that I worry about stuff. And that's it. I worry about stuff. Yeah. Uh, my name is Andy Reiner and I worry about stuff. My name is Enyan Peltatiller and I too worry about stuff. <laughs> so. And all of you out there <laughs> in podcast land, if you worry about stuff too, say it out loud. Say it proud. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. One of the best ways you can support this podcast, River of Suck, is by going to riverofsuck.com and clicking River of Suck Swim Team. You can get all the bonus content for just $1 a month. No one ever said crossing the River of Suck would be easy or that you had to do it alone. So thanks for giving it a chance and joining us on this 
wild adventure across the river of suck. My name is Andy Reiner. My name is Enyan Peltatiller. And you've been listening to the River of Suck podcast. <laughs> Till next time, keep swimming. <laughs>